Great. <coughs> Great. Thank you, Zim. So um, we're going to start with a story. And uh, hopefully the story will have a moral which will set up the evening. So in ancient Greek mythology, the goddess of dawn, Eos, falls in love with a handsome Trojan prince called Tithonius. But Eos is an immortal goddess, and Tithonius is merely a mortal man. So she begs the mighty Zeus to make Tithonius immortal. But Eos had forgotten to ask for eternal youth. So Tithonius ages and withers. He becomes bedridden and babbles all day. And eventually, he shrivels up into a grasshopper. So what's the moral of the story? Well, it's at least that life extension alone is not enough. So please remember that when we're talking about everything today. Um, I'm going to cover four big uh, topics. Um, um, understanding longevity trends. Uh, then we're going to do a deep dive into the science of, um, of, of life extension. And then we're going to cover more um, social, ethical, and political issues. Um, and we may, uh, and that may um, go into uh, the uh, Q and A. In fact, we'll start with Madame Jean Calment, who is the oldest recorded, um, verified uh, person to have lived. And she died when she was 122. And it's quite impressive that she smoked for most of her life, not that much. Um, but uh, she died in 1997, and we haven't had anyone who's got to her age yet. And there's, a, there's probably a reason for that. It looks like human beings have a kind of hard stop at around 120. Um, you know, there's some biological features, and, and that's, that's important. So let's look at, you know, some data on this. <clears throat> So this is data from the Office for National Statistics going, and it shows longevity curves from oh, um, slightly off the scale, but this is 1851 to um, projected down here is 2031. So people born in 1851, um, this is the proportion of people who survived uh, during their lifetime. Um, and, um, and what we see here is that we've seen a very big change in the last um, 150, you know, 200 years, which is that there has been this big trend in compression of mortality, uh, a comp compression of morbidity, um, uh, and a very big change in the increase in the average lifespan. So let's look at the median life. The median life in 1851 um, was 45 years old. The median life expected for someone born in 2031 will be around 88 years old. Um, so we see, we've, we, we will see about a doubling of life expectancy, average life expectancy. But what's interesting is that during that period, um, we will have only seen, um, actually from, from 1851 to kind of current, we've only seen about a 10% um, increase in the 99th percentile. Now, so the 99th percentile is obviously not maximum life, um, but, it's, but it's getting close. So what can we draw from this? What are the big trends here? Well, <clears throat> the first big trend is that there's a squaring out of this curve. Um, so initially, of course, um, there's a square, you know, there's a huge in improvement in, in um, uh, infant mortality. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in 1851, you know, uh, it's about a 25% chance that you won't, won't be around by, uh, after the age of five. Um, so that's been a big improvement. But also there's been a squ an increase, a squaring out of this curve. And you can think of it as um, an increase in the, in, in average life expectancy is a ratio of, of maximum human lifespan, the kind of 120 year number. And that's sometimes called the compression of morbidity. So if we were to think about, you know, what would be the limit of this trend? Um, what, you know, how far could we push this? Well, what we would end up 
is with this kind of rather perfect mortality curve where where everyone would live to you know to 110 or 120 and then just fall off a cliff um, and so that's that's one big trend that we've seen so far which is compression of morbidity but there's another um, trend that we'll be talking about which is in fact something where we're going to need some serious science and that is the increasing uh, using science to increase maximum human lifespan so that would be something like that so what we're what we're you know the science of longevity is ultimately um, going to uh, the, the the completion of the trend will end up in this kind of uh, green curve so very similarly to the kind of population level statistics are the um, individual health span so let's look at let's look at a sort of rather you know a typical life where someone lives to the very ripe old age of 95. Um, and what we see here is their health utility index plotted across their life. And health utility index is 100% represents perfect health and 0% represents death. So what we see on this red curve is um, that uh, someone starts to have declining health. And by the time they're in their mid-60s, they start to have rather poor health, you know, below 50%. And they have two or three decades of poor health and then eventually die at 95. Now let's consider another life, an orange life, which is in fact shorter. So the orange life, uh, the person dies at 90, but they are far healthier throughout their lives. In fact, it's only in their late 80s that they start to have declining health. So the question is, what is the better life? Well, health economists have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and they've come up with a measure called the Quality Adjusted Life Years measure, um, and, or the quality. And the quality is essentially the area under the curve. So the quality of the orange life is, the orange life has 80 qualities. But the longer life only has 61 qualities. So on this basis, the longer life is not the better life. So this is something to, to really um, bear in mind. What we're looking for is something else than length. So the message really is that um, life extension alone is not exactly what we're looking for. We don't want to become locusts. What we want is a squaring out of the longevity curve of the health curve uh, in on an individual basis, we want health extension. So this is really what the science of longevity is about. Um, and as you'll see when we get into the science part of it, this is lucky because it turns out the way we're going to increase life expectancy is in fact by increasing health. So let's look at the, some, some of the science. And now this uh, rather scary looking man is, 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 is uh, a uh, researcher called Aubrey de Grey, and he was a little ahead of his time because I think, you know, probably um, 20 years ago, maybe, or 15, 20 years ago, he had the view that we actually have got aging wrong. Aging is a disease, which was quite a controversial view at that time, but I think more and more people have come to, to uh, accept this view. And his idea was that as we age, we end up um, with cellular and organ system <coughs> level damage. Um, and that increases as we age. But we also have mechanisms, cellular repair mechanisms. So initially, our cellular repair mechanism capacity is above the amount of, of um, uh, damage, cellular damage and organ damage that we're, that we're getting. But at some point, the repair mechanisms start declining and um, they can't keep up with the damage. And the net accumulation of damage is really what aging is. So this is a very interesting view of what aging is. And, and in fact, it turns out that his, his hypothesis really probably has a lot of merit and um, that we're gonna be looking at what is this damage. So 
let's start with one of the first and most important areas in, in, in aging. Um, so this is just a little background here. Um, at the end, this is a chromosome, and at the end of the um, DNA strands, there'll be, the way your cell replicates is that it has to have some excess DNA um, at the end of the chromosomes uh, to allow a cell to successfully, uh, to allow uh, uh, the DNA to be replicated. And every time the cell replicates, a little bit of this um, cannon fodder DNA, telomeres, um, is, is uh, removed. And so there is a limit to the amount of uh, cell divisions uh, that can happen within, a, uh, within a, a particular cell. And that limit is called the Hayflick limit. And it's, it, it varies, but it's somewhere between, say, 60 and 100 cell divisions um, you know, of, of that order of magnitude. And after a cell divides, you know, 70, 80 times, that's it. And now the cell is either senescent, um, doesn't divide, just hangs around, or in fact dies, goes through something called apoptosis. And this is a fundamental problem because it means that, you know, if this is, if this is the case, we can, our cells um, can't divide, you know, as we get older, that we'll just run out of capacity and, uh, and you know, we'll just um, accumulate damage, end up with senescent cells or just um, lose cells, lose cells in the brain or other vital organs and age and then eventually die. So the question is, is there any way around this? Now, there are species that in fact have some very special traits. They can continue to grow. So this is a lobster. It's very, you know, it's very odd. This is a typical sized lobster. And this is a huge lobster. And, 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 and uh, what happens is that um, eventually, th this lobster will continue to grow, but eventually, you know, because lobsters have exoskeletons, it just requires too much energy and they won't survive. But at a cellular level, they have something very interesting. They have an enzyme, and, and, and we humans also exp can express this enzyme, called telomerase. Now, t what telomerase does is it increases the length of the telomeres. And this can happen in humans as well. And it essentially gives the cell, the, I, I mean, you know, the, it gives us a prospect of cellular immortality. Um, so this is going to be something that will be very important if we can uh, um, somehow activate our own telomerase or perhaps activate it through gene therapy. Um, we may be able to get cellular immortality, which will turn out to be an important piece of ending, ending aging. Um, now, another very, very, very important concept in aging is something that the body does us uh, um, automatically, and that's autophagy or autophagy, so self-eating. In every cell, um, the cell can be turned into a kind of repair mode. And uh, especially when, for example, calories are scarce, the cell starts to re uh, recycle a lot of the, 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 its components that aren't working well. well, well, all of its components. So for example, it can recycle proteins, mitochondria, and other um, organelles. Um, and the important thing about this is that we're going to have damaged proteins. So, for example, as you, as you get dementia, Alzheimer's, we're going to have um, uh, misfolded proteins and uh, protein aggregates. And, of course, wouldn't it be handy if the cell could just hoover up all of this uh, damaged stuff and engulf it into something called an autophagosome and, and, and mix it in with a lysosome and dissolve it away and then take the ingredients and build fresh juvenile structures. So completely recycled from, 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 from the start. And this, turn, this is going to turn out to be probably the most important um, technology that we humans already have, except that we're not activating it uh, appropriately. And in fact, we may have to activate it uh, even more than nature intended. Now, over the last few years, 
we really started to understand what are the key pathways that activate this autophagy pathway. And this is a complicated slide, but I'll kind of you know, show you some, some, some key things that you, you want, to, want to know. So one of the most important uh, um, uh, cell signaling uh, uh, complex is something called mTOR. It stands for Mechanistic Target of Rapamycin. And this is the master switch in every cell which shifts the cell from growth to repair. Um, and when we're growing, you know, uh, when, we're, when, when, we're, when we're young, when we're adolescents, we want to, have, when we want to build muscle after a, after a training session. We want to activate mTOR, but we want to inhibit mTOR um, to push the cell into rejuvenation and specifically to increase autophagy and therefore increase longevity. And there we now have various things like rapamycin. We've discovered rapamycin, discovered on Easter Island, a very interesting story of how it was done. It comes from the island of Rapa Nui, and that's why it's called rapamycin, but, and, and that is specifically the target of mTOR. Um, and it turns out that caloric restriction also activates the same pathway. Um, too much insulin um, goes the other way, and there's a whole uh, series of other things called sirtuins, which are where we get uh, resveratrol, the red wine, the active, you know, the, the exciting ingredient in red wine, um, which activates sirtuins, which again lead to longevity. So we're ultimately looking at deep down in the cell to try to find these, these um, characters. Now, what we just talked about is one particular aspect of aging, t telomere attrition, and then, and then maybe some, some, some autophagy. But um, in the last few years, in the last three or four years, we've now identified nine or ten hallmarks of aging. It says nine hallmarks, but now I think I've been told that, in fact, really we should have had a glycation here as well. So it's probably ten, ten hallmarks of aging. And that's interesting because it means that we're not talking about hundreds of factors that we don't understand. We, in fact, know exactly what causes aging. So it's all of these nine things. Genomic instability, so DNA damage, telomere attrition, we talked about uh, declining telomere lengths, epigenetic alterations. This is uh, on top of our genome. We have this layer of, um, actually it's a chemical layer that ca uh, switches that, that um, govern gene expression called the epigenome. And uh, as we age, um, are, you know, we start getting alterations in this, DNA methylation, and, um, and we can measure this. You can actually go into a lab in, um, in one of the London hospitals, and they will tell you, based on your methylation profile, your biological age. Um, loss of uh, proteostasis as we, you know, uh, proteins start misfolding, and we get things like Alzheimer's and, and white hair and all sorts of things like that. Um, Nutrient sensing um, dysregulation that's, that essentially, um, you know, ultimately insulin resistance and, and um, uh, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome. Mitochondrial dysfunction, particularly important. Um, mitochondria are the powerhouses, and as we age, they, um, they don't work as well. And ultimately, well, we'll see what we need can do this cellular senescence we just briefly talked on this but uh, senescent cells hang around and cause chaos and cause uh, inflammation and all sorts of things inflammation itself alters cells uh, uh, intercellular communication inflammatory cytokines and stem cell exhaustion as uh, uh, something i haven't mentioned but but um you know we all have um uh, stem cells as we age uh, these stem cells uh, uh, reduce and Stem cells are incredibly important to rejuvenate um, uh, tissues. So the issue here is that each one of these nine hallmarks of aging poses an engineering challenge. So this is ultimately an engineering problem. Um, we can, we will be able to have stem cell based therapies. There are already therapies that will activate our own body's stem cells and then you know, you can go to a clinic in Thailand already and get fresh stem cells put in. Um, uh, there are factors which are um, uh, changing intercellular communications, factors in young blood, 
um, we will be able to um, eliminate, maybe through autophagy and other things, uh, uh, damaged DNA. Um, um, we will be able to reactivate um, to, uh, uh, telomere length through telomerase. Um, there'll be epigenetic drugs, drugs they, the, um, and uh, uh, nutrient sensing, will, we, we can already start to uh, impact these pathways through various drugs. Um, and uh, clearing senescent cells, um, uh, and something called mitophagy, which is so, which is which is the um, autophagy of mitochondria. So, killing uh, old, stale mitochondria and getting fresh new ones. So, all of these things we already know the path. You know how we're going to tackle these problems. We can't do it yet. We can't do it yet for all of them. But we've got really interesting progress on every single one. So the point of this is that it is only a matter of time <coughs> where we'll get, make progress on all of these and we'll be able to have treatments on all of them. So the science of longevity has got some really serious players in it. Um, uh, I've just, just uh, put a few up here, but there, you know, it's it, like artificial intelligence, it's probably one of the really hot areas um, at the moment. Um, and it's not just governments. I mean, actually, the NIH, the US government, the NIA and the NIH are really serious players, actually. I mean, I'm very pleased that, that, that they are. Not, 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 not many other governments, but the, but the, um, but the US government. Uh, Human Longevity Inc. is, is uh, very famous because Craig Ventner was the man behind the Human Genome Project. That's Peter Diamantis, who uh, is from Singularity. Um, Google, through Calico, has, have, have a really serious effort. This is Professor George Church, who invent, uh, one, of, one of the founders of the CRISPR technology, uh, which is the gene editing technology, <coughs> where we'll be able to change people's genomes uh, using his technology. Um, this is a company called BioViva, and um, Liz Parrish is the chief executive. She is the first person to have had gene therapy, specific, a couple of gene therapies, but one of them specifically is telomerase. So the, you know, she's had a gene inserted uh, through a particular viral vector, um, and uh, we, she is patient zero, actually, in the world. And um, so we'll, 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 we'll see, see the results that she's, she's going to get. Now, the question is, is a long life a good life? Yeah, I mean, um, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately a philosopher, so you know, this is kind of the most important issues. It, and, and, the, and the question is that if we can't live good lives now with our current lifespan, why should any more life be at all beneficial? Um, you know, we might be bored, we might be tired, we might be miserable. So we might have a glimmer of an answer to this question, which is that good lives require development. They require us to develop our virtues and our mental attributes. They require us to develop our wisdom and experience. They require us to develop a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. But if we can start developing these attributes, then more life will actually lead to more development, and so will lead to better lives. And as we live longer and as time goes on, we may be able to create new technologies which will enhance our well-being and actually maybe create a state which we can call super well-being. So, Super longevity, we said, was not everything we want, but it might actually be quite important. It might be important to create super well-being because it will give us the time to really develop our lives. Um, so that's the kind of uh, positive hope. Um, so 
before we before we finish, and we'll probably carry on with with this in the um, Q and A. I just want to raise a few ethical social issues, um, and then um, you know there 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 are probably hundreds more of these issues, but let's just head some of them off. The question, the first thing that people think about is that look, if we're going to live for all this time. How, what, you know, what's going to happen to the world population? I mean, this is terrible. How are we going to cope? How is the planet going to cope? And that's, that's a real issue. Um, so if we are to end aging, um, um, then, you know, is there going to be an explosion in population? Well, there's a few things that we need to think about here. One, one is that what we've seen is that as, um, as there's been an increase in life uh, life extension um, over the last few centuries, birth rates have gone down. And in fact, in Western Europe and in many countries with uh, very high life expectancy in Japan and um, Italy and many, many other countries, um, we are now below replacement rate. So there may be some equilibrating factors. I mean, you know, we, we might be, be something, seeing something different. The second, um, well, so uh, we, we can discuss more of this. Uh, the second point I want to um, um, mention is that, is that we have some really serious philosophical issues around you know, death being very important in human life. And um, the existential philosophers, especially um, um, ones like Heidegger, um, talk about Dasein, the human being, um, being determined by um, the view, the, uh, being towards death, that death gives a sense of urgency to our life. In fact, imbues it with some sort of meaning. So we, you know, this is, this is an important issue to think about. The third one is, you know, well, what do we, you know, how do we cope I with the structure of society? I mean, aging is quite important for our, um, for our, for our uh, careers and our companies. We need to make way for the young um, as we age. And uh, what will happen? You know, we'll just get a, a blockage on the line. And uh, you know, what happens to pensions? What happens to career opportunities? Uh, the fourth area that I think is going to be very important is the exacerbation um, of, of inequality. Uh, I, and I'm actually a little pessimistic about this. I think that... Um, that uh, as we um, progress with the end of aging, um, uh, this may benefit uh, the rich more initially um, and may give them more power. And so I think that you know, this is something that we really need to think about. Um, and the last one is, a, is, a, is, 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 is you know, what does it mean about humanity? Are we going to create a new species? Are we ultimately going to create some sort of a... Um, superhuman elite, a homo deus, as uh, Harari has called it. Um, and this is, this, is, this is really important because, um, you know, we, we need to understand, you know, what, what the ethical implications are, you know, what's going to be of value in this new species. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shamal. Thank you. That was uh, a fantastic tour. Uh, while people get a chance to line up some questions, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. So I'm interested, first of all, in the, the, the science side. Um, I mean, I read that our favorite uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Peter Thiel, wanted to, the, the headline was, Peter Thiel wants young human blood ah. uh, because he wants to live forever. Uh, so, so uh, when we look at the, the science and the, 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 the nature of aging, are all nine or ten of those pathways involved in each of our aging, or do we have a different mix of it? Yeah, so, so the particular therapies or interventions that are, that, that are around are, are going to be hitting several of these things all at once. And it looks like young blood. I know this sounds like a vampire. Um, well, I, I, I'll... I'll should I, should I take you through some, sure, some, yeah, some potential yeah, interventions? Yeah, um, well, so there's something called parabiosis. Well, I'll, I'll come to this. Okay. 
So let's, let's look at what, you know, what kind of um, interventions, uh, including what several Silicon Valley billionaires are doing, not just young blood. And I'll tell you, there's some, some other stuff that they're doing as well. Um, let's, let's, let's go from sort of low risk to high risk. Um, well, uh, probably the one with the most evidence is caloric restriction, but it's probably the one that's you know, most difficult and actually least palatable. Um, we know from yeast, from worms, from flies, from, you know, all the way to primates that caloric restriction increases lifespan. And we have very good evidence for this. But there may be an easier way to do this because caloric restriction is essentially activating autophagy, which I talked about earlier. But, it, but there are some protocols around intermittent fasting and then another one, which is a longer fast, uh, but, but not a pure fast, called the fasting mimic mimicking diet, which comes out of the lab of Professor Walter Longo in um, California, the National Institute of Aging, um, uh, uh, which actually have a very similar effect um, on this. Then there's a whole series of nutraceuticals, um, um, resveratrol, I think we saw on one of the, one of the complex slides, uh, terosilbin, um, nicotinamide riboside, um, uh, curcumin, which is kind of the um, turmeric stuff, um, you know, the, which, which, which are kind of helpful, but maybe not, uh, you know, going to change the needle too much. Then, then we've already got some drugs. Um, there's one very safe drug uh, called metformin, which has been used for years for diabetes. But then we have rapamycin, which does have side effects, and that's really powerful. So again, in terms of, you know, this may be low risk, um, but uh, this one is, is definitely, I mean, I, the way I look at risk is, risk and return is that we're, we're um, either collecting gold coins or we're collecting pennies. And we're either collecting them in front of a steamroller or a tricycle. So, so um, metformin, <coughs> is either a pennies or gold coins, actually, um, but it's definitely in front of a tricycle. Rapamycin is probably a gold coin, but it may be in front of a steamroller, as in, you know, we've got to, we, we don't know what the, the long-term effects are, but it's pretty amazing. And I know, I mean, obviously, you know, in the communities that we go around in, there are a few people doing this, but you've got to be very careful with the intervention, probably just, you know, once a month or something like that. Now. Parabiosis, which is this uh, vampirian type of thing that we talked about. So parabiosis is um, this was this this goes back a long time, um, um, where we were ab able to um, sew together the blood supplies of two um, uh, mice, um, an old mouse and a young mouse. And um, what happens is that uh, the old mice, uh, the old mouse, um, rejuvenates all. You know, damage is, is, is improved, um, their metabolic disorders go away, uh, um, heart disease, diabetes, all this kind of stuff just, just disappears. And all that we know is that they're sharing blood supply. Now, we've identified, you know, what are these factors? Well, it's, it turns out that you don't have to have pure blood. You can just have the plasma. But it turns out that it's probably only about, we've identified down to around 50 factors that it might be in the plasma. We don't know. Everyone's working on it. But the thing is, taking plasma is a pretty low-risk thing to do. What happens to the young mouse? Well, you know, it's I mean, a, a, interesting. I think, I think actually the young mouse probably has, has um, uh, enough reserve capacity. It doesn't kind of, you know, uh, uh, age. Because the, the young mouse is producing the factors. So it looks like it's positive factors that are doing this. But, but all sorts of things can happen. I mean, I mean... You can even have fecal transplants, which go the other way and actually make the young mouse on... Um, fecal transplants, just to be clear. Yes, yeah. fecal transplants. Um, yeah. yeah. Poo. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Um, another a very interesting therapy is um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, this has been around for a long time. It's, it's pretty safe and has... Um, pretty amazing results in terms of activation of um, stem cells, omnipotent stem cells, uh, and uh, angiogenesis, so increase in blood supply, uh, blood, you know, fresh blood vessels. Um, 
both in the central nervous system, so, so for stroke patients and others, but also with, with wounds. And in fact, this is a very interesting area because in fact, we talked about aging is this um, reversal of, uh, if you want to reverse aging, you have to reverse um, age-related damage. Well, um, uh, activation of stem cells um, and angiogenesis do exactly that. Uh, then you have really serious stem cell therapy, which is which is which is um, around now. Um, um, exogenous uh, therapy, and finally you have gene therapy and even gene editing. So gene therapy, um, what uh, um, Liz, Liz Parrish had, um, which is introducing a gene and then finally going around and reprogramming your own genes using CRISPR or something like that, um, and you know. That we need to be very careful around um, because uh, we don't quite know how it all works. So, yeah, there are a number of things that people are already doing. My view is that there are some low-risk, um, high-return things on that list. Um, you know, probably the, 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 the simplest thing is, is actually um, a couple of times a week, uh, you know, just, just having one meal a day or something. That would, that would be fine. That's great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, now we need to know what to do with the slides. Ah, good. Someone did that. Yeah. So, so does it, 